Hello, my name is Richard Tyndall. Today I'm gonna to be speaking to you about our empirical study we did on two Bitcoin artifacts through deep learning. Uh, I worked on this when I was a graduate student at uh, James Madison, uh, and, and as well as uh, Alex Mitchell, who contributed a lot to the, pro to the uh, programming uh, portion of it. Nathan, uh, Dr. Nathan Sprague and Dr. Shunhua Wang were our uh, faculty advisors and, and helped us out with uh, both the cryptography side of things and the deep learning. I'm very thankful for all of them. So an introduction. Uh, Bitcoin, as we know, is a peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency. Uh, the inventor is Satoshi Nakamoto, but what we don't know is who that individual is, as that's a, a uh, pseudonym. Uh, there's a few people that we think it could be. Um, some have volunteered themselves to be Satoshi Nakamoto and, and others have been uh, identified as possible suspects. Um, among those include uh, Dorian Nakamoto, Craig Wright, and uh, Hal Finney, and there's, there's more as well. Uh, during the study, we identified two specific Bitcoin artifacts, uh, specifically the, the source code uh, for version 010 uh, released in early 2009. The second was, of course, the white paper, um, that uh, the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, both artifacts are very formal and, and structured. Uh, we did not include any of the emails uh, or posts or anything like that as they're uh, unstructured and on not necessarily uh, the same as these types of um, uh, artifacts that we used. So how are we going to study these different artifacts? Um, you know, when, when a human creates something, whether it's source code or a book or, or anything, they leave a bit of themselves in that work. They leave a fingerprint of, of their style um, to where you could read a, a portion of, of text written by Shakespeare and say, oh, that, that's Shakespeare. I know it because of the different, uh, the different words that he used or, or the style used or, wh or whatever. Um, and I believe that source code is, is similar to that. It's obviously not a, a formal language uh, like English or, or I'm sorry, it's not a natural language like English, but it's a formal language written in, in code. Um, and when I write code, it might be different than when you write code. I might do things a different way. I might use a, a, an iteration when you use a, a stream or, or whatever. The design choices I make, uh, the variable names I make, all of these are part of my style. Um, and if we can get those indicators, those different fingerprints or, or whatever, we might be able to identify who wrote source code just by the way they wrote it or the style or, or all of these various things. Now doing that manually would be a lot of work. Uh, you would need to know a lot about everyone's coding style and that's a very difficult task for a human, which is why we used deep learning. It's, a, it's an automatic tool with a lot of, you know, the ability to learn the differences between things. Um, and it, of course, it is programming language agnostic. We can use it for any different uh, language. <clears throat> so uh, we should note here that deep learning is obviously not a authorship identification tool. It's a classification tool. Um, and how it works is you would uh, give it a data set with known labels. Uh, those labels could be, for example, Alice and Bob on the slide or whatever, the, the authors of a individual paper in our case, um, or of a source code. And we will use that data to both train and validate a model that will be generated. Uh, and that model will be generated using these different uh, algorithms um, many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, typically, we will use an 80-20 split on the known data for training and uh, 20% for, for validation. Um, afterward, after we've done that, we will take that and make a prediction on unknown data. So in our case, it was the Bitcoin artifacts. We'll talk about that later. But uh, you know, it, that's what it's that's what it's for. Like we've uh, we've trained this model to be able to differentiate between minute differences and, and classify things. So now we're going to use it on something we're not sure about. Um, it has been very successful in many applications. So um, it, it consists, you just need a good model and um, you need, it, it's really good at picking up on very small differentiators. Um, 
in, in our case, we were focusing on the style aspect of it rather than the content, because I think that's better for identifying uh, an author. Here, uh, there are a number of different related works that have been done. Uh, the two that were on code-based authorship that we that we uh, referenced are they use the Google Code Jam dataset, and all these programmers do the same thing, um, and they they accomplish the same exact task in their own way. Um, the first paper used a random forest classifier. The second one did use deep learning. Uh, and how our how our work is different is uh, we did not take a very specific. Uh, ours is more of a real world application. It's not uh, a code jam where everyone's programming the exact same function. Um, we you'll see later which what we used for our data, um, but it, it was not all to do the same exact thing. They all did different things with a similar um, background or, or category. Uh, secondly, there has been analysis on the white paper. Um, a lot of different efforts have been done using various different methods, you have machine learning, deep learning, and just programming, regular old programming. Um, and our work is different, again, um, our work is different as it uses a much larger data set than any of the, the various papers here. Um, we targeted financial cryptographic papers, uh, whereas they used a number of different papers to accomplish the, the, what they were looking to. Uh, so I want to reiterate that classification and authorship identification are not are not the same, uh, and we know that uh, deep learning is used for um, classification. So we will feed it the data and we will give it labels. And in this case, it would be the authors that were uh, or the title, you know, the, the paper itself, who it was written by. And that would be the label or the source code and, and who wrote that. And that's the label for it. And we're going to calculate the relative distance uh, a new unknown is to the, the body that we've already trained on. Um, it's, uh, it's not obviously the same as saying this person definitely wrote this. We're saying this is most similar to these other to this particular paper or, or source code. Uh, and, and to do that, style is going to be a lot more definitive than the, uh, the content or the subject. So we focused on, on that portion of it. All right, so on to our study. We have done, like I said, we have done two studies, one on the authorship of the Bitcoin source code and another on the authorship of the Bitcoin white paper. The, uh, for the source code, we did a character stream. Uh, and for the authorship, uh, we did a word stream. And, and because it is written in English, it makes more sense to do a word stream, whereas these words have um, individual meanings versus the characters. And a source code may not be, uh, may not have a whole lot of, of meaning to, you know, the whole, the whole but uh, the stream made more, more sense to do for the Bitcoin source code. So a little background on the source code so that we could identify what data we should be using for this. Uh, the Bitcoin source code uh, we, we went with was the earliest version we could get, and it was the uh, 010 source code, and it was released in January of 2009. Uh, it has 15 header file, files and nine source code files, and it uses OpenSSL for any of the cryptographic functionality. So we want to take data that is similar uh, in the same kind. We want to take cryptographic libraries. Specifically, we want to take the ones that were written, the versions that were written around the same time as, uh, as our unknown. Uh, we, so we took them around the same time frame as 2009. Uh, we want to know who wrote them. So this is our, our known data set. We're going to pass this into our deep learning algorithm and output a model. Uh, and next, we will take the source code and feed it into the same program uh, using that model we created, and it should output a uh, a author or or a um, yeah an author of, of these source codes that would be closest in difference uh, or in distance to that to that source code. 
the data set we chose specifically, uh, we picked 16 different labels. And here they are. Uh, we have uh, BC Key by Hal Finney, uh, CryptoPP by Wei Dai. I, I, don't, I won't read all of these. Uh, important things to note is they all written, they were all written around the same time as uh, the 2009 uh, Bitcoin. Um, and they are all, with the exception of, of two that I'll speak on, uh, they all have a single author. Um, there was uh, TrueCrypt had no disclosed authors and uh, we could not separate them. So we treated that as, as one author, even though it is a group. So the group at CryptoCrypt, at, at, uh, tr sorry, the group at TrueCrypt um, is treated as a, a single group. Uh, the NSS team library is it's also a team that, that coded that, and that was hard to separate uh, the whole file. Uh, for all of the other ones, we were able to separate, if they had multiple authors, we were able to separate them based off of the uh, copyright notice, and we created separate labels for those authors. Um, and many of the other ones just had a single author. So right away, the first problem we have to solve is a data imbalance. The, the data that we have coming in, uh, some, some of them have more files, some of them have more data uh, than others. And with that type of a skewed data set, it would be very difficult to get a meaningful result. You're going to learn more about one of these larger libraries than you would about one of these the smaller ones. You'll have more data. Uh, so this would not produce a good result. So what we needed to do was uh, balance the data. We do that by creating what we are calling uh, mutants of the data. The, uh, the source code, uh, we do that by, by permutating some of the different sections in the source code. We're not changing the characters used, we're changing the order in which they uh, appear in the file. Uh, specifically uh, the, the different preprocessor directives, some of the different struct definitions, etc. Uh, within those sections, you know, not moving the entire section around, but moving some of the different lines around in that section, uh, we can create mutants that are very close to the original, not being the exact, uh, not being the exact file. These mutants uh, can inflate the data, so we have enough of the data to train on. So after data balancing, we have at least 100 source code files for each label. Uh, and then for each label, we're going to randomly select the files, uh, read them, remove any comments, and, and format the characters to generate fixed size 400 characters per sample, and then uh, 1,500 samples per label. From there, we will take the data, uh, of course, encoding and tokenization. We're going to use 80% of the data for training, 20% for validation. And uh, from that, we will uh, we'll create our data model after feeding it into the... Uh, the different layers that we have here. And uh, we know that the, the model is good if the validation accuracy is high. And uh, with that, we had our accuracy on this slide. As you can see, it's approaching uh, one. Well, we're never gonna get quite there, but we had a, uh, after 20 epochs, we had a, a fairly accurate uh, model. And we can see the validation data is also increasing. So that's good, that's what we wanna see. So now it's ready for the unknown data. So now we will take the Bitcoin source code, which again is a, a file base, 24 different files, and uh, we're gonna run it 81 times. Each time, uh, because of the individual, um, because of the different weights uh, that vary as we, we throw them in, it's gonna give us different results each time. So we wanna take the average of that. Uh, and the validation accuracy is about as high as 89, 0.1%. Uh, so we'll average that out. So here are the different results. For some of the Bitcoin files, classification was uh, ambivalent for two of the different labels, CryptoPP and, uh, and TrueCrypt. These are the ones that I'm, I'm showing now. They, It's not a big enough difference. As you can see, the first one there is 51% for CryptoPP, 49% for TrueCrypt. It's too close to call. Uh, the second one, or a, a few of them, uh, clearly favor the CryptoPP as now outlined. Uh, and then finally, there is uh, quite a number of them that clearly favor the uh, 
the true crypt library. Um, and those are now on the with the green arrow. Uh, so what can we take from this result? We, you know, we have a number of different ones that go to one file, some go to the other, some are a split between two, uh, or one of them is a split between three. So what we can do to interpret this is we can say uh, none of them were classified as going to Hal Finney. So this shows that Hal Finney is not likely among the Bitcoin author or authors. Uh, the model that we used is pretty definitive on that. Secondly, uh, the Bitcoin source code seems to have a number of different styles um, or a style that indicates multiple different styles. So it appears that it could have multiple different authors. Uh, and again, I'll remind you that we're not even saying that the Bitcoin author is in any of the authors that we um, that we use to train the data model. There is that inherent flaw, if you will, or risk. We don't know. Uh, what we can say is that of the authors that we trained our model on, uh, and all of these authors are write source code, very similar types of programs, cryptographic programs, and they wrote them around the same time. Of that, we know the relative distance between any given file and the uh, and the source code uh, went to a number of them went to TrueCrypt, a number of them went to the the WayDie uh, application, um, but none of them went to, to the Hal Finney. Uh, so we can say that for for uh, our positive results there. So the second part of our white paper was uh, about the authorship of the Bitcoin white paper. Um, and a, there's something to note here. We, we don't know for sure if the Bitcoin white paper was written by the same individual who wrote the Bitcoin source code. We can't be certain of that. Um, so they, they may be the same, they may not, but we're going to analyze it using uh, a different data set. So this part is generally uh, the same here. We're going to take white papers this time. Uh, dealing with financial cryptographic uh, topics. And we're going to feed that into our deep learning program. We're gonna output a different model. And this model will be used to validate, or sorry, to um, to test against our unknown, the, the uh, Bitcoin white paper, which we'll pass in and generate hopefully a, uh, a label. Or we will generate a label, a prediction of, of the relative distance between this and any of the ones that we trained on. So uh, a little notes about our, our data set. Um, Bitcoin is obviously not strictly cryptographic. It's also a financial paper. So that allowed us to pick uh, some financial incentives uh, or sorry, some, some financial papers as well. Um, specifically, it would be great to find papers that are financial and cryptographic and uh, they would need to be written around the same time as the white paper. Um, so that is one of the main reasons we, we did a time bound on it from 1997 to 2012, excuse me. And the 2012 cutoff was also due to the Bitcoin becoming popular after that, that time. And um, at that point, a number of people could have written about it, whether or not they were the expert on it. Um, so that gives us uh, Way Dies, B Money, and a number of others on the screen uh, for a total of 436 different labels. All right, so for this text-based deep learning, uh, we're, each label, we're going to, to read the data as words, again, not as characters, to a fixed size, uh, 100 character samples. Uh, for each label, we will get 40 samples, and we're going to check them, make sure they're different from each other. Uh, we're going to send that into 80% for training, 20% for validation. We're going to send that into our model. Um, and as you can see up there, it has an embedding layer, bi bidirectional LSTM, and two dense layers. Um, and again, the model is good if the validation is accurate. So we ran the program 100 times, and the validation accuracy was roughly 55%. Um, we ran it that many times, and they do the different initial weights, uh, and, and each time the predictions can vary slightly, so we averaged them out. 
uh, among the 436 different labels, uh, we identified four different papers that were closest to the uh, white paper, uh, the Bitcoin white paper, and that is the Brandt paper, Weidai B-Money, Pagnia Jansen, and the Jacobson Jules paper. Um, again, we, we are not saying that any of these are the author of the Bitcoin white paper. What we are saying is those four, um, the characteristics and the style were closer to the Bitcoin white paper than any of the other ones that we tested. So to conclude, uh, we use deep learning to create two different models uh, to identify likely authorship uh, of the Bitcoin white paper and the Bitcoin source code. Uh, for the source code, we selected the version 010, uh, and we determined that Hal Finney is not likely one of the authors. Uh, and we also determined that there are multiple styles within the Bitcoin source code, and that could indicate multiple authors. For the Bitcoin white paper, uh, we identified four different articles that were close to the style of the Bitcoin white paper style. Um, and again, Finney and Wright are not in the top four. Uh, the next step would be to take an even larger data set and, and repeat data set and repeat this experiment. Um, to see again if we could find multiple authors that were closer, even the ones that we analyzed. Uh, thank you for your time.